When you're in the Insert Wall Library, you can access the framing tools by selecting the framing layer, then right-click and select Framing Tools. Here you can see that this wall has been set up to use a framing tool called ext-2x4b from the Wall Framing Library. We have a number of different framing tools available, and we also have a couple of different libraries. Depending on the version of Vertex you're using and the wall type that you're looking at, the form might look slightly different. Our metric versions are different than our imperial versions, as well as wood versus steel framing. In this video, we're looking at the imperial wood version. Here I have the name of the framing tool, so that's the same name that's listed up in this drop list. We have a panel label prefix, so when we start generating wall panels, they'll all start with 1E. We also have a system set up to automatically change the number 1 to match the floor number that you're on. When generating wall panels, there's also another place where you can override this and put in whatever prefix you'd like. Framing Detail defines this as being an exterior load-bearing framing tool. You can also choose interior load-bearing or interior non-load-bearing. LF Material Code comes into play when you want to estimate the framing material based on the lineal foot of the wall. So you can actually generate a framing list without generating framing. This is useful if you're only using the architectural features of Vertex. You can also define how it's going to frame out corners for exterior corners and interior corners. In each case, you can select a detail from the selection picture. To select a detail, just left click on the diamond. We have selections for T-intersections. So if you have a load-bearing wall teeing into this wall, or a non-load-bearing wall teeing into this wall, you can choose different details for each case. We have vertical types of T-intersection assemblies, as well as horizontal blocking. We also have selections for the panel ends. You can choose a different detail for whether it's an end-to-end -end panel seam or if it's free end. In each case, you can choose whether it's a single stud, double stud, or one of these other built-up assemblies. Panel edge gap will shorten the panel so that you can have a little tolerance gap between end-to-end -end panel seams. On the studs page, you can choose the stud material and quantity for your on-center studs as well as a different stud material and quantity at sheathing seams. When I click the SEL button, that lets me choose a different material from our profile libraries. We have a number of different libraries, as well as different sizes within each library. In this case, we're using our generic lumber library, and we have codes associated with what that material is being used for. So in this case, I have a 2x4S for the stud material. We also have BLKs for blocks, CRs for cripples, HDRs for headers, JCKs for jacks, PLs for plates, and SIL for SILs. Or you can choose a grade-specific library where all the materials are predefined to use a very specific species and grade of lumber. I can also copy that selection to the other material selections within the framing tool. Here I can choose which materials I want to copy that to. Stud spacing is the on-center stud spacing. Stud start from controls how that spacing is measured, whether it's from the left end of each panel, the right end of each panel, the middle of the panel, or we can start at both the left and right ends and work towards the middle. Free will evenly space the studs, and under trusses will automatically add an extra stud underneath any trusses that you may have modeled. If you choose center stud, you can also select double center stud, which is sometimes useful in gable wall situations. 
Plates and Blocks allows you to choose the details and materials in the top plate and bottom plates. We also have quantity selection for the number of top plates and the number of bottom plates. You can choose to add horizontal blocking through the entire panel or end blocking will only add the blocking at the first and last stud base. In each case, you can choose the material, the heights of the blocks. We have some examples from the drop list, but you can type in whatever values you'd like. Just separate multiple values with a space. And then the blocking type, whether it's flat or if it's on edge up against the interior side, exterior side, or both sides of the wall. The openings page defines how it's going to frame out doors and windows. You can choose the material for the sills and how many sills, the material for the cripple studs above and below the openings, and then selections for the headers, jacks, and kink studs. We have it broken out into three different ranges based on the width of the opening. Here you can set a max value for range number one. So openings up to 48 inches wide will use header number one and this selection for the jacks and kings. If it's wider than 48 inches, up to the next max value, which in this case is 96 inches, then it'll use header number two and the second range of selections. Openings wider than 96 inches will go on to use header number three and the third range. In each range, you can define the header assembly, the header material, jack and king material, and the quantity of jacks and kings. As the openings get wider, you can have it automatically create stronger framing. For the header assembly, you can choose from either top header assemblies along the top plate, dropped header assemblies, which are just along the top of the opening, or flat stud headers for non-bearing situations. Click on the diamond for the assembly you want to use and then select the materials and quantities. If you're interfacing with automated manufacturing equipment, the Anchors and Service Holes page lets you set up general rules for defining holes on the bottom plate for hold downs and anchors as well as service holes on the vertical studs for electrical and plumbing. You can type in individual heights and you can define multiple heights by adding a space between each value. Now I'm going to click OK to close the framing tool, then click OK to select the wall, and now I'm going to start drawing a couple of these walls. Now each time I draw a new wall, it's making a copy of the properties in the framing tool. So now I have one, two, three, four copies of that framing tool. Each one is identical at this point, but I can select one wall and change the framing tool for just that one selected wall. I can either right click, go to the properties and select the framing tool just as we did before. Or, with the wall selected, I can just right-click and select Framing Tools from the pop-up menu or Framing Tools from the Wall tab at the top. So now I see all the changes that we made before we inserted the wall, and I can make additional changes for just that one selected wall. If I look at the Framing Tool of an adjacent wall, I'll still see that it has the original value. Only the wall I changed will have the new value. This means if you have a certain wall that has a higher loading requirement, you can just go into the properties, adjust the stud spacing or how it's going to frame out openings to satisfy those requirements, and adjust other walls to satisfy their own requirements. We have more information on our documentation site about how to create new wall framing tools and new walls in the wall library.
under Administration and Customizing, Walls and Wall Panels. And here we have a number of different topics about creating wall layers, a new wall library, and the new framing tool.